Good evening. I'm Irene Harold. I'm the Dean of Libraries and University Librarian, and it is my delighted pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event. This is our author talk on Miracles and Machines, a 16th century automaton and its legend with Elizabeth King, Professor Emeriti of Sculpture at VCU Arts and author. I know that many of you know Elizabeth better than I do, but in my role as the head of libraries, I'm honored to share some information about Elizabeth before we get started. But first, a few housekeeping reminders. This is a quiet floor, so when you exit, please keep your voices to a whisper. And for the Q&A portion, we had over 200 people sign up for Zoom, and so we request that you use a microphone so those on Zoom may hear your questions too. Finally, a thank you to our bookseller tonight. We are honored to have Fountain Books, they have their storefront on East Cary Street in my neighborhood in Chaco Bottom, and it's an independent general full service book full store serving the Metro Richmond area and the world since 1978. And here with us tonight is Andy Richardson, um, who is the manager, you said, of Fountain Books. So thank you. You can purchase books for the um, a book signing following the conclusion of the talk. So we also have Crystal Carpenter, who is the head of archives and special collections. And she pulled a few of our artist books from our over 4,000 item collection. And she's at a table with them. And if you hadn't had a chance to wander over and look at them, they'll be on your way to the book signing. So you'll have an opportunity to gander and interact. And finally, it's my pleasure to recognize my colleague, Dean Carmenita Hickenbottom from the School of the Arts in the back of the room, who is with us tonight. So thank you all for being here. So Elizabeth is a native of Ann Arbor, Michigan. She earned her BFA and MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute before moving to Virginia to teach in 1983. She joined the develop department, had the development, I've got it on the brain, sorry. The Department of Sculpture and Extended Media at VCU in 1985, teaching multitudes of students until her retirement in 2015. I think retirement's a loose term. She's not retired, she's still working. In her art, Elizabeth is known for her figurative sculptures that are intimately scaled and demonstrate the perfection of many traditional crafts, such as carving, modeling, casting bronze, firing porcelain, woodworking, and glass eye making. These works, often modeled on herself and female relatives, incorporate a level of realism and an articulated range of movement that recalls 18th century automata. Her figures often feature lifelike details such as subtly raised veins, wrinkles, and even eyebrows composed of her own lashes. I could be her model. Wrinkles, yeah. Their operations can involve hidden spring-loaded elements, magnets, pendulums, and fiber optics. Elizabeth has written extensively about automatons and other concerns related to her art. Thanks to her generosity, her first book, which is back on that back table, Attention's Loop, A Sculptor's Reverie on the Coexistence of Substance and Spirit, is for sale tonight after the talk, and all proceeds from the sale of her older work benefit the endowment for special collections and archives at VCU Libraries. We thank Elizabeth for her generosity. And her sculpture pupil is the book's main visual subject depicted in photographs by Catherine Wetzel that explore representation and deception, artificial and human. And VCU Libraries is delighted to share that thanks to an inquiry from Elizabeth, Catherine's photos for the book will be part of the collections of special collections and archives as we anticipate their official donation soon. And we look forward to one day sharing the news, hopefully not soon, 
that soon would be nice, that Elizabeth's papers have joined our collections as well, but that's currently an in progress donation. So tonight's program on Elizabeth's second book, written with clockmaker and conservator W. David Todd, Miracles and Machines, which is also for sale on that back table, a 16th century automaton and its legend, is a study of a Renaissance automaton in the Smithsonian Institution collection and the legend behind it. Elizabeth became interested in the subject of the book while taking a group of sculpture students to the Smithsonian on a field trip in the late 1980s. Elizabeth has been recognized with a Guggenheim Fellowship and awards from Anonymous was a woman, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, Harvard Radcliffe Institute, Virginia Commission for the Arts, and the National Endowment for the Arts. She's also received artist residencies from the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation and Dartmouth College. In 2017, she was elected a member of the National Academy of Design, and she is the subject of a documentary film, Double Take, The Art of Elizabeth King, directed by Olympia Stone. Her work can be found in the collections of the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, Hood Museum of Art, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Metropolitan Museum of Art, Museum of Fine Arts, Houston, Sheldon Museum of Art, Virginia Museum of Fine Art, as well as to institutional and university collections. VCU libraries recognize that the land our buildings occupy once belonged to the Powhatan people, and we express our respect and appreciation to the people past and present. We also acknowledge that our country and our city of Richmond as the former capital of the Confederacy are built on a deep, long and ongoing history of exploitation, prejudice and marginalization. We recognize that institutions of higher learning and libraries both have a history of exclusion. And while we may not be able to correct these problems at the national level, we work to improve ourselves for the benefit of the communities we serve. We seek to include, reflect, and give agencies to the varied experiences of our community, being mindful of the historically marginalized, AAPI, BIPOC, LGBTQIA+, and ADA communities, hosting programs that are reflective of the variety of communities at VCU, Richmond, Virginia, and the globe, such as a work on a sculpture from the 1560s Spain, is representative of the intellectual and cultural engagement of our university and community, exploring art, technology, and history. Join me in welcoming Elizabeth. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Can you hear me? I know the HVAC in here is a little loud, so yeah, looks sounds good, sounds good. It's extraordinary to sit here and look at who's here and see the faces of people, some of whom are beloved friends from long ago and I haven't seen in a while, and then others that I dearly hoped would come and they're here, and I can't thank you enough for coming. Um, um, I have a short talk, 35 minutes exactly, but I just really have to thank a, a few people who made this possible. Um, Kathy Graber made those beautiful um, movable type print cards that are on the book table back there, one for everyone for this talk tonight. Um, and Kelly Gottschalk and Antonio Vassar and Ryan Pander made me put this together in a wonderful and welcoming way. Uh, Jeannie Scott is here. She's been at the library for over 40 years. She was head of interlibrary loan when I started working on this book and got me every single book, every single book that I needed to do the research for this. Um, a hand for Jeannie Scott. God bless her. Also, Cody Whitby, I don't know if he's here, but he designed, helped um, build a designed website that I started about the monk a few years ago. And also thanks to Crystal Carpenter, who is sitting behind that table with those wonderful objects on it. I'm so glad she's here tonight. Also, shout out to Yuki Hibben, who started so much of what we all do here um, in the library and BCU. 
Jimmy Gaffrey, who was my husband, Carlton Newton, student at William and Mary in 19. I can't remember, I'm really happy to see him here. And then I also have to thank my husband, Carlton Newton, uh, who I hope is here in the audience. I want to thank Ashley Kistler, um, who was sort of with me and listened to me complain for so many years that finally I'd started in and she would interrupt me and she would say things like, she'd clear her throat and she'd say things like, um, looking into the future, what do you think you might be able to be? Anyway, thank you to Ashley. Um, Matt Charbonneau is here. Matt scanned David Todd's early drawings. And so those beautiful drawings in the book of my co-author David Todd's were scanned by Matt in the graphics lab back in, I think back in the aughts a long time ago. So many other people here um, uh, that I wanna thank. Um, Mary Flynn, Michael Keller, because they published uh, the very first essay that I wrote on this little automaton in Blackbird. Um, the very first volume of the online Blackbird, and they did a beautiful job, and it's still there. Bear with me while I fuss a little bit with the technology. This is a book about a single object, a small automaton made in Europe in the late Renaissance, now in the collection of the Smithsonian Institution. My co-author is David Todd, the conservator who kept the automaton in working order for 30 years. He worked at the museum. Our photographer is Rosamond Purcell, famous for photographing objects in museums of science and natural history around the world. Automaton figure of a friar, the museum labels it. Spain or South Germany, mid 16th century, wood, fabric, iron movement, 16 inches height. Made in the early decades of the rise of the spring powered clock in Europe. The monk, as it was first called, and still best known, though monks and friars are not the same, arrived in good condition. Only the cloth tunic and the cross were not original. It walks by rolling on three wheels meant to be hidden under the tunic, feet stepping forward from beneath the hem. As he walks, the monk strikes his chest with one hand and raises and flourishes a wooden cross with the other. His head and his eyes pivot to gaze at the cross, then the onlookers, then the cross. His mouth opens and closes as if in speech. From time to time, he brings the cross to his lips and kisses it. If the mainspring is fully round, he will walk about 20 inches and then turn to his right and repeat the sequence seven times. And I have Carlton Newton to thank for this diagram. Um, which he made from a bird's eye view video that Scott Nolly made at the very last minute, literally the day or two before I submitted the manuscript to the Getty, we finally could um, nail down the exact walking path that the monk follows if he's fully wound. The eyes are made of iron, hammered round and painted. Here's a quote from our book in David's words. The kiss done, the monk raises his head and continues his advance across the table. And now his eyes move slowly to the left, giving the uncanny appearance of a sustained sight line fixed on a single point as he walks past it. Brief as this is, if an onlooker happens to occupy this spot, he will likely feel as if the monk has singled him out for special attention, in effect, keeping an eye on him. The surveillance lasts just so long, then the eyes dart forward as if in dismissal. As the monk pivots to march in a new direction, his eyes once again stay momentarily locked on the person toward whom he had been headed, and he holds the gaze as he turns away. The mainspring can be wound ahead of time and a hidden stop work lever can be set 
to hold the action until the right moment. And those purple gloved hands were Scott Molly's hands. The monk arrived with a story. It was said to have been made by Juanello Turiano, clockmaker to Emperor Charles V, and then to his son, King Philip II of Spain. Juanello was legendary at court, physically massive, brilliant, and perpetually filthy from working at the forge. Writers of the period celebrated his clocks, his inventions, and his automata. And there's a welcome new biography of Turiano that came out in 2017 by the historian Cristiano Zanetti. Among surviving automata similar in their clockwork to the monk, two had already been attributed to Juanello by historians in the early 20th century. So the suggestion that the monk too was made in his workshop was plausible. But the story goes on citing a dramatic event in the Spanish court. In 1562, Crown Prince Don Carlos of Spain fell down a flight of stairs in the university town of Alcalá de Henares near Madrid and struck his head. He lay in delirium for weeks while the best physicians of the empire tried to save him. When medicine failed, Friars opened a tomb in the Church of St. Francis and carried the preserved corpse of a local lay brother, Diego de Alcala, dead for a hundred years, through town to the prince's bed. The prince survived. Rome eventually made Diego a saint for the miracle. This early 17th century engraving shows the saint ringed by a cycle of his many documented miracles. Diego was the first counter-reformation saint. A mission in his name in the New World later became the city of San Diego. The canonization documents now in the Vatican include the daily reports of the prince's physicians, and these are among the most detailed records we have today of wound care, infection, and surgery in 16th century medicine. This comparison of the, the engraved portrait of San Diego next to the automaton's head comes from a 1976 auction catalog from Geneva with text explaining that Philip II ordered his clockmaker, Juanello Turiano, to create a state-of-the-art likeness of the life-saving friar. In 1977, the automaton was purchased by the Smithsonian. But did the king make such a commission? Where did this part of the story come from? This is the framing narrative of our book. Who made the monk? And is it really a high-tech votive icon of a saint? I first saw the automaton and met David Todd in 1989. Christopher Furman, then a student here at VCU, wanted to show it to us and arranged for a class field trip. David met us in the museum's former hall of timekeeping where the monk was on view. This photo, taken by another VCU student, Marjorie Albertini, shows the monk in its vitrine as we saw it then. Even with our robot jaded eyes, the figure looked uncanny. When he asked how it was made, David took all 20 of us downstairs to his basement shop to show us the kinds of tools a 16th century clockmaker used. How did we all fit in this tiny shop? His tools were antiques in their own right, brought from England where he trained. While we were there, I remember hearing him murmur the story of the wounded prince. Here is David in the 1980s doing a bit of maintenance on the castle tower clock at the Smithsonian. An expert in 16th to 18th century English, European, and American clockwork, he trained in his native England, apprenticed under third generation clockmaker Cyril Boniface, 
who preserved the family command that a clockmaker be able to make a clock without using modern power tools. David was museum specialist in timekeeping from 1978 to 2006 at what was originally the Smithsonian's National Museum of History and Technology. Its name later changed to the National Museum of American History. He arrived just a year after the monk itself. One of his first tasks was to examine the automaton and put it in working order. He analyzed the wrought iron clockwork and confirmed its 16th century metallurgy. Then he made an exact model of it, but a little larger, that museum visitors could wind for themselves to see the figure in action. Using mild steel, he fashioned plates, wheels, and cams the same way the originals were made, hand tools only. Skilled staff at the museum crafted the body of transparent acrylic. Making that model gave him deep respect for the technical skill of the maker of the monk's clockwork. He was struck by the unusual concert of actions that culminate in the kissing of the cross. The head bows and turns to the left. The left shoulder and elbow bend in unison to raise the cross. The eyes look at the cross and the mouth snaps in a ferocious kiss. The mainspring that drives all this is far stronger than would be needed for the hands of a clock. David's model in Rosamond Purcell's luminous photograph. In addition to the care and feeding of the vast population of clocks in the Smithsonian, David has also restored and repaired some of the world's finest early timepieces, including the clocks Thomas Jefferson commissioned for Monticello. After he retired from the museum, David set out to realize his dream to make an iron wall clock patterned after 16th century German tradition with only the tools such a clockmaker would have used. Working in a restored blacksmith forge in rural Virginia, he hammered out his wheel blanks from scraps of iron and steel. It took him two full years. All the while, we were also working on our book. Making that clock gave our book its metallurgical heft. He took photos of the whole process of making his clock, almost 400 in all, and captured them. Quote, with the great wheel blank clamped in my post vise, I am cutting the teeth using a hacksaw with three blades ganged together. That done, I could round them up with a smooth half round file. When working on the left side of the tooth, I had to be careful not to cut into the finished surface of the previous tooth. This is David's clockmaker's lathe, called a throw, itself made in about 1700. He is turning a, claw, a collet for the clock's escape wheel, powering the lathe with his left hand and cutting the work with his right. No motors here. The clock from behind, almost complete, a weight-driven clock, the wakes will be attached to the cord coming off the great wheel drum. The finished clock, keeping time to about two minutes a day or better. In my own work as a sculptor, I make half-scale figures that are jointed for movement, and I pose them in different ways from show to show. I work in carved wood, cast porcelain, and various metals. I too have a lathe in my shop, though mine has a motor. From the start, movable joints were paramount. In this piece from the 1980s, head and limbs are slip cast porcelain, bones are cast bronze, joints are machined brass, each material chosen for its task. The shoes are carved wood. Carving those shoes, I realized that wood on wood joints would be better and lighter, and I could pose the figure more easily. I made this sculpture by both carving and machining, modeling too for the head is porcelain. I call it pupil. Made long before I saw the monk. It's now in the collection of the Hirshhorn Museum, right across the mall. A chance to make a stop motion animation with the sculpture in 1991 with Richard Kizu Blair at Colossal Pictures in San Francisco. Blair and I choreographed the motion, and two great animators, Mike Belzer and Trey Thomas, 
brought the figure to life. A recent bronze portrait, again, half life size. I mount glass eyes inside the head, lots of machining so the eyes fit perfectly. Each eye is held in place with three tiny springs and is movable in its socket. I carved a pair of small jointed hands of English boxwood. A few frames from a stop motion film of one working with Danish animator Peter Dodd in London. But I love best simply posing the pieces, even just the gaze. So David and I are a clockmaker and a sculptor writing a book about a clockwork sculpture. Work on the book went slowly at first, for we were both working under other guns. This image kept me going. An x-ray David asked the conservation lab to make so we could see inside the monk's head without taking it apart. The fineness, not just of the mechanics of moving eyes and mouth, but of the wood carving itself comes into view. And you can even see the original seam where the sculptor blew the back of the head on after the mechanism was installed. Our book is divided into 27 short chapters. One of David's chapters takes the reader on a visual tour of the monk's clockwork. This is the mainspring and fusey. Spring power brought the portable clock into existence and with it a new kind of automaton. The cone-shaped fusey is an ingenious device for equalizing the uneven force of the spring. It came into use around the mid 15th century and released clocks from the necessity of the hanging weight, rendering them portable for the first time. The monk's spring is tightly coiled inside its barrel and is very powerful. When David removed it for cleaning and laid it out at rest on a table, it was a great open spiral ribbon of steel, the blade an inch and a half wide and almost five feet long. Coiled within a two inch wide barrel, imagine the force the spring holds. Like many clocks from this period, no signature or stamp appears in the monk, but the clockwork shows the layout and tooling marks unique to 16th century ironwork. Typical here is the tab and slot joint uh, securing train bars to plates, held fast by a tapered pin or wedge hammered through the tab. Clock wheels were laid out and cut by hand, tooth by tooth. Visible in this photo are the cam and levers to the head, eyes, mouth, and right arm. We know of seven surviving figures with clockwork similar to the monks, all in collections in Europe. I traveled to see them in 2019 and 2020. Each one gets a short chapter in the book. The oldest may be the 16th century citron player in the Kunsthistorisches Museum Vienna. A little taller than the monk at 17 and a half inches, she was given to the museum in 1934 and attributed at that time to Juanello Turiano. Her clockwork design is more primitive with no eye or mouth movement. Here she is on display in the museum in her magnificent robes. I took this photo the day before the museums in Vienna were closed by COVID. The attribution to Juanello Triano had been based on an entry in a 1575 encyclopedia of Spain's riches and relics by Ambrosio de Morales, court analyst to Philip II. In a long chapter on Juanello, we find, quote, the lady that plays and dances, Juanello as a diversion, wanted to create anew the ancient statues which moved and were called automata by the Greeks. He made a lady more than one tertia high, which is about 11 inches, who placed on a table, dances all over it to the sound of a drum, which she plays herself and goes round in circles, returning to where she started. Though it is a toy and fit for mirth, it is nevertheless a great proof of his high intelligence. And that was all a rough translation of that last paragraph. The citron player's clockwork is too fragile now to wind her spring. But just last year, 
a librarian working in the archives of the Warburg Institute in London, discovered an old film made in 1936 and sent it to the Kunsthistorisches Museum. Curator Paulus Rayner graced us with a copy, and we thank him for permission to show it. I have to say, seeing this film was one of the greatest thrills of all the years we spent working on this book. You have to remember looking at the monk that he was dressed and the movement itself makes the dress move and gives the whole figure more animation. You can see it in this, in this figure. Beautiful motions of the head, incredible hummingbird hand. This is another automaton. This one is in the Deutsches Museum, acquired in 1985. my photo of it in the conservation lab. We don't know what this automaton is doing. The left hand was entirely missing on arrival. The right hand has lost its two middle fingers. No way to know if the now restored hands are what they once were. Did they hold something? The heavy bracket at the waist clearly supported some kind of object or instrument. The motions of the eyes are even more apparent in this figure, maybe because repainting shows whites and irises in more contrast. The mouth too is in motion, teeth in evidence. Together with the movement of the head and hands, the illusion of attention is striking. And I'm grateful to conservator Thomas Rabenyi for these amazing videos. In some ways, it's kind of wonderful not knowing what it's doing. It's almost as if it's got a message for us and it's really trying to, really trying to get the word out. The feet, too, were missing. New ones were made by an earlier conservator copying those of the Smithsonian mock. It was shipped to a show in Vienna, and when it came back, the back of the head had come off accidentally, and Thomas was mortified. But um, everyone decided that they would display it with the head, with the back of the head off, and they would display the back of the head by itself, also in the same vitrine. The figure was first housed in the Deutsches Museum in galleries devoted to the history of the computer. Another figure in the Museum of Applied Arts in Budapest is classified under decorative arts. The monk itself was first installed in the Smithsonian's Hall of Timekeeping. It's no real accident, all these different homes, these automata really do require many kinds of knowledge, but this mixed classification has kept historians from seeing them as a kindred group. One more automaton here seen in four views from a private collection in Italy, restored by Giorgio Gregato, conservator and clockmaker in Milan. A matron of nobility playing a drum, he calls her, circa 1560. Thank goodness he didn't repaint her face. The back of her head can be removed for a fine view of the mechanism inside. 
Her clockwork is very similar to the monk's, with moving eyes and mouth, only she moves much, much faster, almost frantically, earrings flying. You can find a great video of her on the web, and our book, by the way, prints websites of all the places where you can see these automata, if they've been filmed, where you can see them moving. For scale, this whole head is not much larger than a walnut. Her remarkable goiters, for that is what Gregato calls her impressive jowls, really steal the show. The wooden solo walkers are modest compared to the jeweled composite automata made in the same period, emperor's gifts to emperors. With the clockwork is similar, in this piece, Diana on a centaur, the pedestal contains the clockwork, and the whole thing rolls across a royal banquet table. The centaur shoots a golden arrow, and where it lands, that gust must empty a goblet and deliver a fitting toast. The figures are made of silver and gold with inset rubies and emeralds. Period writers looked to these jeweled wonders for the defining technology of the age and missed the first true androids, clockworks entirely hidden inside moving bodies, whose virtue lay not in precious stones, but in material realism. And I just want to mention um, this piece, which is in the Green Vault in Dresden, was recently restored. And the conservators found an interesting little probe under that pedestal that can actually detect the edge of the table and halt the machine. Needless to say, the wooden figures don't have those probes. And maybe that's why there aren't very many of them now. We search for the monk within the broader history of clockmaking and clockwork automata. This is an engraving of a late 16th century clockmaker shop. We consult inventories of wonder cabinets, reports of appearances of automata at court, religious processional icons, and images of possible automata and works of art. This 1587 engraving depicts a tabletop garden menagerie sculpted in sugar. Automata often appeared in such banquet settings, a world in miniature. A famous 18th century engraving, a small walking automaton performs for spectators in a candlelit room. Our search for the maker of the clockwork is paired with our search for the sculptor. For it's the sculpture, after all, that commands our emotional response head, hands, and feet, visible from beneath an intended cloth tunic, were painted in lifelike color. This is another photo by Marjorie Albertini, one I love. A key theme of our book follows the rise of polychrome wood sculpture that coincided with the rise of the mechanical clock. This is Alonso Cano's small, tender sculpture of our very saint, Diego de Alcala, finished in 1657, not much larger than the monk at 23 inches in height. Another small Diego by the 17th century Spanish sculptor Pedro de Mena, now in, where else, the San Diego Museum of Art. Polychromed wood, glass eyes, piece of ivory or horn, 24 inches tall, half life size. Cano and Mena show not the miracle of the prince's cure, but the miracle of the flowers depicting the saint in his younger years when his duties as gatekeeper of the convent, um, he would sneak bread from the bakery and hide it in his robes and give it to beggars at the door. And when the, when the um, priors confronted him for the theft, he opened his robes and out fell not bread, but bunches of roses. The influence of popular legends in artists' depictions of saints is the subject of my chapter on polychrome wood sculpture in Counter-Reformation Spain, where, in defiance of Catholic decree, sculptors outdid themselves producing works of emotional realism. Here is another depiction of a miracle by Pedro de Mena, 
the pose captures St. Francis standing in the torchlight of a pope who has been searching for the saint's tomb in a dark Assisi sepulcher 200 years after the saint's death. St. Francis standing in ecstasy is a sculpture of what the pope and other witnesses reported they saw. A sculpture of an apparition, we would say now, but that word would not have been used by such witnesses. Carved for the Toledo Cathedral, painted wood, ivory teeth, glass eyes, eyelashes of human hair, and cincture of braided cord. Again, half life size, 33 inches tall. It is meant for close up interaction. While historians of technology identify the monk as an early example of a self-acting automaton in the golden age of clockwork, art historians have not followed suit in recognizing the monk's equally significant connection to European polychrome wood sculpture. Not just art history and the history of technology, but episodes from the histories of religion, medicine, philosophy, folklore, even politics, all play a role in our book to fully understand this automaton. We argue that the monk and his few surviving cousins are the first true androids in the history of artificial life. Those with moving eyes and mouths may also well be the first interactive androids. Our final chapter returns to the prince, the sick room, and those who witnessed the miracle. Our book has followed our search for the source of the legend connecting the automaton to the miracle, and we do discover the elegant source of the story. Is the monk a portrait of Diego de Alcala? Without spoiling what I hope is our crowning chapter, I can offer a few quotes. The monk, an icon by any name, models in votive intercession everything the physicians were trying to do to rewind the prince's vital spring and put him on his feet. In both miracle and monk, we sense the forces in play between medicine, mechanics, and faith. Where does the agency of craft end and that of faith begin? What is proper to the human realm and what proper to the divine? Not long after Diego was secured in the pantheon of saints, King Philip II had the tomb in Alcala opened once more to remove the bones of the saint's lower legs, still bearing flesh, for inclusion among his sacred relics. He, too, wanted to be able to touch the life-giving body of the saint. Seen today, the monk brings us face to face with our own ambivalent relationship to artificial life the illusion of agency, the psychology of belief, the virtual humanness of an avatar, and our passionate arguments about what a robot can and cannot do. Did a 16th century viewer think the monk was a live thing, animated by divine spirit? Fooled even for a few seconds, the effect has an afterlife in us. For David and me, it's a miracle that the monk was made and that it survived. Thank you.